All right, uh, now we're gonna talk about uh, Facebook and the machines taking over. I often talk about corporate machines taking over our government. Uh, but in this case, it's almost quite literally machines, certainly artificial intelligence taking over our society. Um, and uh, and there's great disagreement about this. Uh, the right wing and Glenn Greenwald, I don't know what his exact politics these days say that uh, the Facebook doing anything about artificial intelligence, uh, basically spewing out and basically promoting and spreading hate would be an attack against free speech. We wanted to bring on his old debating buddy here, Larry Lessig. He's the Roy L. Furman Professor of Law and Leadership at Harvard Law School and one of the leading intellectuals in the country. Larry, I say old debating buddy because I don't know if you remember, but Approximately 10 years ago, you and Glenn debated Citizens United right after it passed right here on the Young Turks. I do remember that, that was a lot of fun. Yeah, so these days you're back to debating, but he's doing it on Substack, you're doing it on your Medium <laughs> blog. And and so Francis Hogan came out, the whistleblower, or as Glenn would say, the whistleblower from Facebook. And, and she exposed how, um, hatred spreads on Facebook and why it does. And the mechanics of that was super interesting, but it instantly became political. I wanna talk about both aspects of it, right? But first, let's start with Glenn's point of view that, oh my God, if you listen to her, she's, as you pointed out in your article, she's been duped by the left wing conspiracy and this will shut down right wing speech. Why is that wrong? Well, you gotta focus on what the problem is that Francis and other people are pointing to. Because the problem is not that Facebook might have certain kinds of speech, whether right wing speech or left wing speech or hate speech or whatever. The problem is Facebook is a manipulation engine and it manipulates by amplifying and suppressing speech, not because it's trying to be liberal and not because it's trying to be conservative, not because it's trying to influence us in an intelligent way. It manipulates simply to find the speech that addicts us the most. And too bad for us, it turns out the speech that addicts us the most is the politics of hate. The more they can ridicule and and trade on emotion and trade on ignorance, the more we focus and the more we engage. And so focusing on the particular speech just misses the forest for the trees. Because the critical point is the engine of manipulation that is driven not by how do we produce understanding, but how do we produce the most addiction to this platform possible? Yeah, now th- this is why it's such a difficult question. I mean, there's the, I- I'm gonna just dismiss the political side of this because Glenn and, and the right wing don't mind that stuff being spread around. Why are they upset and calling it a left wing conspiracy? Because they're the ones that are spreading the hate. And they're like, don't, don't stop it, don't stop it. Because it's getting us views and revenue and exposure and fame and all these things. That part of it is super obvious. We don't have to spend a lot of time on that. But the, the harder question is what to do about it. Because now if you said, okay, a right winger cannot put on there that on Facebook X, Y, or Z, well, that, that is a problem, right? And and then mm-hmm. the question is, where do you draw the line? Can the right wingers say, uh, I particularly don't like Jews? That's free speech, right? It's right. free speech in the context of government, but not necessarily a private company like Facebook. Can he say, go do X to the Jews? Can, what can they do? Where's the limit? Uh, let's start there because it, the conversation continues to be super interesting after that too, but that's gotta be our starting point. Okay, but the point is, if there were no manipulation engine, you know, if this were AOL way back when, when people could get into groups in AOL and say whatever the hell they wanted, whether it was anti Jew or anti black or whatever, it wouldn't be a problem because they would say that and it would fade into the background. The reason it's a problem is that the engine knows that this speech is fire. And the more that they can uh, um, amplify and spread this speech, the more attention people will pay to it. So the point is, we ought to focus on the engine of manipulation and talk about the kind of interventions that really tamp it down, just slow it down to make it so that it's not producing this craziness solely for the purpose of that company making ungodly amounts of profit. But so th- there's the problem right there, right? So. 
if you say, okay, don't limit what people are saying. And of course, there's gonna be some limits that a private company is gonna put on what you're saying. You can't break the law, you can't say kill all the Jews because that's deeply problematic. And so there's of course some limits, I think we all agree to that. I'm not positive the right wing agrees to that, but I hope they do, right? Uh, but once you get past that limit, and we're at really reprehensible speech, but allowed, right? Um, then you're saying, hey, but we don't have to spread it to the whole world. Back in the day, AOL didn't have an algorithm that spread it to the whole world. But the reason it spreads is not because Facebook wrote code that said, if you find hate, spread it. It spreads <laughs> because humans like it. That's the real yep. problem. <laughs> well, they like it. In the way that they like potato chips. I mean, you know, when they're consuming it, they're really happy about it. But after they've consumed it for an hour, they're like, oh my God, why did I do that? And this is the whole trick. These manipulation engines figure out how to draw us in, exploiting weaknesses of human psychology. You know, that just so happens that we respond to random rewards or we respond to endless wells of content in a way that makes it so that we can't stop ourselves at some level or we don't choose to stop ourselves and then we regret what we've done. Um, and so the point is, if they're exploiting our weaknesses for the purpose of making money, but the consequence of that purpose or that objective is to make politics broken, even more broken than it was before, at some point we've got to step back and say, is your profit really worth America's democracy. Is it, you know, they've made a hundred billion dollars in the last five years. Is it really important that you make a hundred billion dollars in the last five years uh, if the consequence of it is events like January 6th? And and I think that the answer to that question is no. And 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 Francis and others have focused on the kinds of interventions that would not put Facebook in the business of like deciding which speak it, speech it likes, but instead disable the machine that's amplifying in a way that we know is producing this craziness. But Larry, they're, they're not gonna do that. So uh, the, because you have to go back further. Uh, we When we said corporations in America can maximize profit and that they don't need to have a second line of code. Their only line of code is maximize profit. A Facebook would naturally rise, it is inevitable. And it would, and that algorithm would naturally realize, man, people really get engaged when there's a fight. And, and, and everybody knows this from their personal lives. At spring break, nobody ever says, hey, look at those two guys are agreeing, right? They say, right. oh my God, look at those guys are fighting. And then the whole crowd gathers around, right? So that's human nature. So there was going to be a company that exploited human nature to maximize profit. And it's not just one company, of course, we're talking about Facebook here. But you mentioned algorithms on TikTok and certainly Google, YouTube, you name it. And all their algorithms are a little different and they all incentivize slightly different things. But they're at the end of the day, they wanna keep people engaged so that they will make more money. So how in the world are you gonna fix that without fixing the root cause, which is that in American law, we don't put a second line of code for corporations. Well, we, you're right, we don't, um, uh, and we could, uh, and we're gonna see other countries doing that um, because other countries you know, have a functioning government unlike ours. And um, they've recognized the extraordinary harm that Facebook is doing in those countries. I mean, you know, we don't remember often, but 90% of Facebook's audience is outside of the United States. But 90% of Facebook's spending on safety measures is inside the United States. So we're not talking about people getting angry in some of these countries around the world and like, you know, yelling at their neighbor. We're talking about genocide. We're talking about governments using the platform to rile up people to kill other people. And the platform, mainly because they haven't invested to even be able to understand the speech in many of these areas because the language is relatively obscure, just fuels it and drives it and continues to push it. Now, here's one example of what could be done. Facebook's own study demonstrates that posts that have been reshared twice are four times more likely to have misinformation than any other regular post. And if it's reshared more than twice, 
that probability goes up substantially to being 10 times more likely to be misinformation than anything else. If Facebook were simply to say, okay, you can reshare something twice, but after the second reshare, if you wanna share it with your friends, you're gonna copy the URL and paste it in your message or paste it in your email. We're not saying you can't share it, but we're gonna disable the kind of mindless ability to share it in a way that Facebook knows will exacerbate the anger and frustration that people have on their platform. Now, Facebook's own study says that that change alone would probably do more than all the fact checking that goes on on Facebook right now. And so the point is this change would be a simple, really literally very simple technical change to make. But that technical change could have a substantial effect in reducing or eliminate much of the misinformation without picking and choosing the content of the message, just slowing it down like a speed limit um, would slow down people driving cars. Cuz we know humans aren't very good at driving cars at 170 miles an hour. Yeah, that opens up three uh, different issues. First, let's talk about freedom of speech here cuz you make a really interesting point in the article about this. So uh, in this case, if we adopted that rule that you're talking about, would we be limiting the speech of humans or machines? Right, um, I think you're limiting the speech of machines. You're not limiting the speech of humans, I can still post. There's no like constant, I mean, this is one of the interesting problems of constitutional law. Does the constitution embrace whatever the technology happens to give us the capacity to do? Because you know, 10 years ago, you couldn't push a button and have your messages sent to 40 million people across the world. Now, it might it's a good thing that we've got better free speech engines, but we have to be able to calibrate whether those engines are actually producing harm that we could avoid through small tweaks to the way that those engines work. And I think we need to take account of the consequence of this manipulation especially when we recognize that it has nothing to do with manipulate. I mean, I'd be happier if the platform were manipulating on political viewpoint. I mean, you know, the National Review manipulates on the viewpoint of conservatives. Um, liberal publications, The Guardian manipulates on the, possession, the position of being uh, not conservative, not maybe not completely liberal, but the point is they've got a political view. And I understand what that view is and people can accept it and embrace it based on their uh, own politics. But this is manipulation that has nothing to do with politics, nothing to do with understanding people, nothing to do with spreading knowledge. It has only to do with what it knows will trigger the worst part of our brain and produce the worst of us. And I don't think it's a free speech problem to take account of that. How you take account of that certainly could raise a free speech problem. But we've got to be free to to uh, to regulate these manipulation engines, these kind of um, uh, um, replicants that exist within our society, um, if we're going to preserve ourselves against against the consequence of their manipulation. God, there's so many interesting things there. First of all, when Republicans say no, we don't want you to limit it. Um, if they just stop right there, it's kind of an admission that hey, we don't want to limit the spread of hate. Because we are the hate, right? And so yeah. that's a fascinating admission by one side of the political spectrum. But it's of course more complicated than that. That's that's their initial raising of their hand. They're really worried you're gonna limit that kind of speech. Um, but but now back to the profits for a second. When you say limit to re, uh, to two uh, reshares, no tech company would ever do that voluntarily because it would significantly right. cut down on their profit. So it must be the government that mandates that, right? Well, here's the interesting politics of Silicon Valley. Apple wants to be the safety company. It wants to build a privacy protective safe environment. And Apple is an extraordinarily powerful platform for Facebook. So if Tim Cook tomorrow said, look, I'm not gonna have any poisonously viral technologies on my platform. And if you wanna be on my platform, you've gotta to demonstrate to me that you're not spreading this kind of poisonous viral content. And one way to do that is to limit your reshares to two. Um, but until you do that, I'm not gonna allow you on the platform. Overnight, Facebook would make this change because Facebook can't afford not to be on the Apple platform. So I don't think government's gonna do anything because obviously government's broken in a thousand ways. 
But I don't think there's nothing that can happen. And I think there's actually a commercial interest. And you know, let's be clear, I'm not saying Tim Cook would do this because he's the most virtuous person in the world. He would do this because he realizes it burnishes his brand and he wants his brand to be more valuable. So this is competition against competition. But the consequence of this kind of decision, um, which is an idea that's being pushed by the Center for Humane Technology. Um, it's, a prod, it's a campaign called One Click Safer, um, uh, is something that could be done tomorrow and would have significant effects, I think, on exactly what this platform does. Okay, now after all this, uh, here comes a funny turn. Uh, I, I don't agree, and so let me explain <laughs> why, okay? Uh, so if you said to me, hey, we are gonna discriminate against misinformation. I would say, yes, I love it. Because I, if a company says, I'm not gonna allow lies, that, that makes sound policy sense for a company, a corporation. For example, we don't allow lies. If you, allow, if you lie on air, I'll fire you, okay? And even if you lie in favor of the left wing, I'll fire you. Because we're, that's not what we're doing, we're doing truth here. Uh, to the best of our abilities. So Facebook could easily make that decision and I would love that. And by the way, if it's the left wing that's lying, then great, block them, right? If you can, now obviously there has to be standards for that, there has to be rules for that, and it has to be egregious, right? But if you, no problem with that. You wanna limit misinformation, you wanna limit violence, makes perfect sense. You wanna limit hate, it makes perfect sense. But when you say, Larry, we should only allow for two shares, well, that also, and, and here's my bias, obviously, but it also goes towards an actual point that affects everybody. That would also limit our shares. And we're fighting against well, racism, we're fighting against hatred. We're trying to uh, give people actual facts. So that disables the bad guys, but it also disables the good guys. Okay, but look, first of all, there is no way that Facebook can actually make judgments about quote misinformation for the millions of posts that are being put on its platform in real time. I mean, maybe eventually, like, like Zuckerberg lies or misleads when he says that 94% of the misinformation is taken down. What he means by that is 94% of the information which its algorithms automatically identify as misinformation is removed before it's shared. And that's a good thing, but that's only five to 6% according to their own documents of the misinformation that's being spread. They're spending millions, maybe billions to sort of regulate this right now and they just can't do it. And just think why, what is misinformation? Like you mislead a little bit, you bend a little bit, when are they gonna draw the line? And I frankly, and this is where I share, I think Glenn Greenwald's anxiety, I'm frankly very anxious about the idea of these tech companies making judgments about whether I get too close to their line. Because what are they gonna do? They're gonna systematically shut down anything that's not totally safe and that's gonna make it harder to be aggressive pushing new ideas and new speech. And then on the other side, look, two automatic reshares, but people can still share whatever they want in the old fashioned way, just share it with your friends. But and Larry, the point that Facebook realizes. But but Larry, you know, and, and because it's the point of that rule is that it's gonna limit sharing. So it's gonna limit, no, 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 no. What they see it limiting is a certain kind of content that gets shared, misinformation. It limits the, the stuff that's triggering and, 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 and fomenting the kind of anger and fury. That's what it's most significantly limiting. Now, of course, it's gonna limit the ability of somebody to take your video and share it 50, you know, for it to be shared 15 times. But is it a terrible thing if we say to your followers, look, Take up the take up the lead. You know, share it the way you used to share it. Like put it in an email message, or put it in a post, or put it on your It'll web page, or whatever. And I'm being realistic. Well, it, so that well, that but, will but, but, greatly but, limit but, your revenue, your reach, your engagement. I'm, it's it's well, like, but okay, no, no, no. I I agree about the revenue. And again, this is they wouldn't do it. I agree with you. They're not going to do it voluntarily. But Tim Cook and Make it do it. But my point is, we had plenty of viral sharing prior to the automatic reshare buttons. We had plenty of movements that took off. Think of the Stop SOPA movement, all these movements that take off because people take it on themselves to spread the word. And because they're spreading the word to people they know, it is more significant and more effective. This kind of resharing, this kind of automatic resharing is producing an extraordinary amount of destructive 
activity on the net. And so if you can't, if you have to embrace the idea that whatever the technology enables, it can drive at 180 miles an hour, then you have a constitutional right to drive at 180 miles an hour, then we're gonna drive ourselves off a cliff. And that is exactly what we are doing right now. January 6 was that cliff. It is a product of an engine that can't begin to tap it down to human speed. And we have to be able to make that judgment. I don't know if it's two reshares or four reshares. I, I mean, we, we don't actually have the data because they're not sufficiently transparent about it. But we can't accept the view that whatever the technologists give us has to be constitutionally mandated. Because the technologists are gonna give us all sorts of things to take us to hell in a handbasket. And if we can't yeah. resist it, then, then things are gonna be pretty ugly. But so Larry, first I'm gonna make your case and then I'm gonna <laughs> ask you what I think is a hard question for all of us, for humanity. Uh, so you know, you mentioned in your post, uh, there was uh, the AI, uh, the artificial intelligence algorithm at, at Facebook created a group called Jew Hater and, and sold that to advertisers. So let me, let's be clear, a category for advertisers for Jew haters. It's a, you know, within their advertising engine, you could you could advertise to Jew, Jew haters. Facebook didn't, the algorithm didn't create a group Jew haters, it created an, uh, an ability to advertise to them. Right, okay, interesting distinction, but important. Okay, so then, um, uh, and then you've got a thousand examples, you know, for people who are depressed, they actually wanna look at things that depress them. And so it further yeah. depresses them by serving them. Uh, that material and, and now I mean this is the probably the most devastating stat poll just came out one out of every six Americans not just Republicans one out of six Americans believe in QAnon uh, the, that there's yeah. one of the parties is a satanic death cult that uh, sexually abused children kills them and drinks their blood one out of six every Americans that is the most stunning fact of my lifetime okay so now and then on top of that I'm going to read a quote from the Wall Street Journal that you also quoted It's from Jeff Horowitz he wrote in his piece about Facebook if a thing has been reshared 20 times in a row it's going to be 10 times or more likely to contain nudity violence hate speech misinformation than a thing that has just not been reshared at all okay now I would argue that uh that are the things that we share are filled with hope and other parts of humanity that that also resonate with people. Okay, and I could um, if they only focus on the negative here, I bet I could find that in the data as well. But the bottom line and the hardest question of all is, Larry, you're in a sense saying we got to stop us from being us because this well, is what appeals to people. Well, no, I do, I don't think that's fair because. We are also people who don't want to be misled. Just like, you know, when you talk about somebody who has an eating problem, an eating disorder, and they can't stop themselves from eating buffalo wings, you know, and once or an alcoholic who can't stop himself from drinking alcohol. One part of him is a person who just wants to drink alcohol, but another part of him is a person who doesn't want to be addicted to the alcohol. And I think it's the same point here. We all, all of us using digital technologies experience this moment where we're like, oh my God, this sucked so much of my life away. And you could say from one perspective, yeah, I chose to do that. But from another, I think we feel that the technology is doing something to us that we don't like. And we've got to take responsibility for it. I mean, I removed all of the social media apps from my phone. There's not, I don't have Twitter, I don't have anything on my phone. I've dumbed down the phone so it's just used for the function that it needs to, that I need to have it for, because I myself knew it was having this effect. So one point is it's not that we are just getting what we want because we want to be better too. And we shouldn't have to face technologies that are that are fighting us to be the worst we can be. Like why should we have to wake up and be constantly confronted with stuff that tries to turn us into crazy people? The second thing about this is we can see, I mean, this is another Facebook study that's been quite famously discussed many, many times. We can see how they target people in the middle on the right and middle on the left, and they feed them content to get them more engaged. And then they run them down the rabbit holes um, on the far left and on the far right into craziness. So on the far right, um, you know, it's QAnon, it's uh, the three percenters. On the far left, it's anti-vaxxing, like you signal that you like organic food, eventually they're gonna feed you anti-vaxxing things. And what we know is that people are, ridden, are driven down those holes and they're not in a position to judge whether what's happening to them is real or not. I had this happen to me myself. I, last March, 
clicked on an article that's talking about how old geyser in Yellowstone is gonna explode and it's gonna be the end of the world. And then they're describing how for $3 billion, they could tap into the um, underlying uh, magma and reduce the pressure and it wouldn't be a problem, but that's too expensive. And I thought, wait a minute, it can't be $3 billion is too expensive to end the world, uh, to stop the ending of the world. So I read about seven or eight articles and in the end, I didn't think there was much to it. But then over the next two weeks, I started getting more and more articles in my uh, Google newsfeed, like article after, after article about this problem. And, and eventually I saw a friend, you know, this is COVID, so I wasn't seeing friends much, but I went for a walk with a friend and I said to him, what about that, uh, you know, old guys are gonna explode and be the end of the earth. And he's like, what the hell are you talking about? And I realized the engine had fed me information that it knew I was gonna click on and it had recreated my whole view of what was going on around me because I didn't have any sense that this was not an objective perspective of like what I should be paying attention to. It was a perspective of what I should be fed. If we can't take that into account and think about how we respond to that, then we are just, you know, ultimate manipulate uh, uh, the manipulations of these artificial uh, uh, AI technologies. I mean, you know, you started this talk. I think it's a very important part way you framed this whole discussion, Cenk. You said, you know, we had we've been fighting against the control of corporations over our lives. And now we have a new control of AI. I think that's a really important way to think about it. You know, corporations are in many ways more rational than we are. They can engage in collective political engagement much more effectively than we can because they've got profit and they got rationalized accounting to figure out exactly what they should be doing. And they've been playing a pretty good game and beating us again and again and again. The AI is an order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude better than the corporation. And it too will be the manipulating for its own purposes. And you know, you and I have been in the fight against the control of the corporation. We have to be open to the idea that we need to be able to control the control of the AI too. So last thing then, um, you know, when w w my dad, to your point, uh, one day calls me this a couple of years ago and says, you know, I, I'm on Facebook and I'm amazed. It turns out Americans love news about Turkey. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and he doesn't know, but by the way, he's not alone. I talked to uh, several QAnon people. I had them on here because I want to know how are they thinking? Where do they get their information, etc. right? Later, the New York Times will yell at me for that. But, uh, but they, what they said was, what do you mean? This is the only thing I see. And so yeah. it becomes, it's not just that it gets amplified what they're seeing, it becomes the only thing they're seeing. That when yeah. you go down yeah, the rabbit right. hole, you can't get out. There, you don't get yeah. uh, uh, served other information. Now, having said all that, we have to acknowledge that yes, we are being paternalistic here, right? Because we are saying like the AI in some ways, the algorithm shows us a mirror of ourselves. I mean, we don't like what we see, mm -hmm. but it's not just a mirror. To your point, it's a mirror right. that amplifies. Okay, right. and and I actually think the part where we probably have a disagreement is, I think it also amplifies the hope, the love, the positive things. Okay, we just haven't gotten to it yet. <laughs> okay, we have, the but data, it's overwhelmed I, by the violence, I, the hatred, etc. But that is humanity, right? And so, so. We have what you're saying is to some degree, yes, the government must protect us from us because if we and and by the way, that is part of the core of law, right? We we don't allow robberies in the streets, we don't allow murder, we don't allow rape. Is that the core of this issue? Yeah, I think these platforms are imposing what an economist would say an externality on our society through the loss of privacy, through the manipulations, through the driving people to content that we know is harmful to them and harmful to our society, it's an externality. And the externalities are huge. You talk about the one in six who believe in QAnon. I think the extraordinary fight around COVID is another bit of data that we should point to. I think the fact that half of Republicans think that there's clear evidence Joe Biden stole the election. These are three pretty important data points to demonstrate that this machine of information, this economy of media is producing unbelievable ignorance in the public. Um, you know, even worse than ignorance. But the point is, we are producing this because of 
the platform of information. But there was nothing like this in 1970. There was nothing like this produced. Instead, in you know, and we're not going to go back to 1970. But my point is, we just can't sit back and say there's nothing to be done. We have to take account of what these machines are doing to us, and we ought to be free to do something to to slow them down at least, so that we don't produce whatever rabbit hole is going to be the next rabbit hole. I'm terrified, Jenk. You should be too. I think you are. You're more cynical and depressed about the future than I am. It's always my job <laughs> to be the optimist. But 2022 is going to be a freaking disaster. And it's going to be a disaster, not just because they failed to pass what I told you they would pass and they haven't, HR1, not just because we will gerrymander uh, through the Yazoo and they will suppress the vote, not just because of that, but because this machine of manipulation is just begging to produce the hatred that will drive people to consume it so that they make so much more money. And nothing's gonna step in and stop that in the next two years. And what do we do then after that, that happens? I think we need to step back and realize this is a significant, a huge problem that we need to be willing to at least acknowledge and take on as opposed to what Glenn does, which is to kind of pretend this is, you know, should we allow Nazis to march in Skokie? It has nothing to do with Nazis marching in Skokie. Who cares if Nazis march in Skokie? Well, I imagine if I were Jews, a Jew and I was in Skokie, that would be a problem. But my point is, it's not going to be the end of the nation. But if we don't think about how these platforms are throwing us all into these rabbit holes and manipulating what we think for profit's sake, not for ideological sake, but for profit's sake, then I fear that as bad as it seems right now, it's going to be much, much worse. Well, as usual, Professor Lessig, you're getting me to think about it more and rethink my positions because, um, it, you know, to your point, 82% uh, of Republicans now believe that the last election was rigged with zero evidence, not, not zero one evidence. piece of evidence, and they convinced 82% of the one of the major parties in this country. And there's no way in the world that wouldn't have happened without an amplification machine. They created exactly. an amplification machine and that has created the amplification of the misinformation. I mean, Mark Twain had that old line about lies get around the world before truth can get its yeah. boots on. Oh, he should have seen it now. He didn't, yes. see, he didn't know anything. Wait, <laughs> wow, wait till you get a load of the algorithm. And, and my last thing here is, in, in my book uh, that still hasn't come out and woke about for a while, but anyway, I write about democratic capitalism as opposed to democratic socialism. That the point of democracy is to check capitalism because otherwise capitalism runs amok. And here yeah. it is running amok. And so yeah. we, there's no question we have to do something, but what that something is is incredibly tricky and we all have to think it through and come up with an idea. And yes, the government is supposed to protect us. That is its core job. And yes, from time to time, protect us from ourselves. Yeah, all right, all right. Uh, Professor Larry See Lessig from Harvard, as always, uh, a great conversation. And thank you for uh, thinking about this and, and, and putting these ideas out there on a super Thanks important issue.